Hi, I'm Robin and thanks for tuning in to this painting guide and tutorial video. I'm going to start out with some base preparation, showing the magnets that I use on them, then followed by surface priming, the airbrushing stage, masking with masking tape, doing some nice decals on those ships, some fine detail level improvements and then pin washing. I've added chapter markers so you can dive in exactly where you need to. And here we are now starting out with that first step on the basing. So these little magnets are 3mm in width. I believe they're 5mm in height. And they're convenient in that the ships from the Fort Evan shipyard, the ones that I had printed on Shapeways, I don't have a 3D printer, so I had them printed. I'd initially scored the bottom of these to place a metal disc across there, but it turned out those actually fit in perfectly and that means if you put them on top of a ball bearing you've got that opportunity to shift the attitude of the ship so all of those shapeway ships just happen to have a perfect peg size so that was a lucky strike for some of the slightly more awkward ones like this ship from brigade models i put the usual steel disc on the bottom and this GZG1, again, just a steel disc. Because they have a small peg hole, but it's the size and shape for the plastic nylon stands. And because I'm heading for a kind of magnetised solution, either putting a magnet on the ship or putting a metal plate on the ship, I've had to uh, glue that on. And that's a topper from the Corsac engineering stands. So using that Corsac topper, I'm going to put a small ball bearing in there by gluing it into the, the top. And then that's going to be the sort of perfect position to mount the magnetised ships on. Particularly the ones that I want to have the ability to change the attitude on by sort of shifting them slightly. They fit uh, neatly on top of these stands from Corsac Engineering. So it's just a screw on for that topper. And it's, it is a metal top that will, it is, you know, it would attract a magnet. Just gluing it in with some super glue and then I'm going to pop the ball bearing into that socket. Now, one thing I always say about these Corsac engineering bases is that they were expensive but I've used them for just everything that I need for a flying base for. You could even use it for fantasy gaming, I've used it for my Imperial Skies game and Full Thrust and any other Starship type of game. And you can see that little magnetised edge just fits on there perfection so for storage obviously I, I take my ships off the stands and I can keep them in a normal sort of miniature tray uh, or on a metal plate they are magnetized onto a metal plate so that's great for storage as well and then reuse the stands for whatever game system I'm uh, currently using the heavier ships are not so good for this um, because the heavy metal ones you'd need quite a strong magnet to support them. These ones you can just uh, play and be comfortable that it's going to stay exactly where you want it to stay. And you know, most of the time you're going to also keep it in that, that parallel horizontal position. Uh, it's only going to be for a bit of fun that you might want to adjust the attitude and sort of show the ship at an angle uh, if you were uh, doing a particular manoeuvre and wanted to show it leaning into it. It doesn't really have any game consequence other than it just looks interesting. And the last bit of prep on these ships from Ground Zero Games was just putting onto the hard points the small weapon mounts that go on there. So in addition to the standard gluing on of those metal plates and magnets to get these sorted, this was really the last thing I needed to do, which was just to pop some super glue on these to mount the weapons after I dry fitted just to see that they go on okay. This is just to show you that on this magnetised ball bearing stand that I've put together, that the smaller ships from Brigade Models, the metal ones, they can also fit on there and you can adjust that attitude to, to give them an interesting look in flight. And the magnet obviously doesn't have that neat peg hole like the Forever and Shapeways printed ships, but it still fits it on there okay. And that's just to show you that also the convenience of having some metal or a magnet underneath means that when I'm painting I can 
pop them on a stand like that to airbrush and the airbrush can then can be angled up underneath in different directions while I'm in the middle of doing the, uh, the paintwork. I use a iWater HPC Plus airbrush. I have it on that quick disconnect nozzle so I can switch airbrushes. I've had this for 10 years, this one. It was my second airbrush. My first one uh, was an Aztec and this one I got for my 40th birthday. So yeah, just under 10 years ago and it's you know, served me well. I have both my airbrushes beside me just uh, over here on that little stand and I mean it's really recommended. You can't really work with an airbrush without a stand because if you've got any paint in there and you want to take a break uh, if you put it on its side even with a cap it's going to fall out so it's a good good point really. Always try and find some kind of little stand that you can use or somewhere you can hook the airbrush. I'm using the surface primer from Vallejo, the German Panzer Grey. I tend to use a grey generally on models that I'm going to spray lighter colours on just because uh, a black is harder to get some of the brighter colours onto when you do the, the next coat. My airbrush booth here with the extractor is by a company called Bench Vent. Uh, they make one which is an internal one which doesn't have an external hose and then they also make one with the hose connected. I have the hose on here leading outside. This is my Bambi silent compressor and it is silent. It does take a little while to charge up, about two minutes as it pumps that uh, reservoir full, which is not noisy when it does it anyway, but once complete you get about 10 minutes of uh, uh, usage with incomplete silence because it doesn't have to keep refilling up the reservoir as it maintains the pressure. These little steel discs, which I've got in the container here in front of me, are from RP Tools and they actually provide them with the handle for painting and it allows you to glue those onto the bottom of whatever model you're making and then the RP Tools handle here has two magnets on the top and you can just pop the model on top of there so the steel disc is glued on with super glue. I use the Gorilla Super Glue, just means I get double purpose out of whatever steel disc is on the bottom because I use it during the airbrushing process like this so I can get around it and paint around it and then I'll use it on the miniature when it's connected to its magnetic stand for gaming. I've got some interesting news about this surface primer from Vallejo but just starting out here I use uh, a couple of drops of airbrush flow improver in the reservoir just before I put the surface primer in and that means I get a mix in there because that Vallejo surface primer tends to be a little bit thicker and I've heard people say things like using a 0.4mm needle is better than the 0 03 in here to prevent clogging. But to get around that I keep my pressure up a little bit more and then the airbrush flow improver in there too. And I mix it in the reservoir. Then it was just a gradual process of layering on a thin layer of the primer and just working around all of the little details on the ships. It takes some time and actually blasting them with a, a can of primer is much quicker but uh, as you can see as I work through it uh, gives me a nice fine result on there and I know that I'm in control of not overloading them with too much paint. So I upgraded at this point because uh, I got a bit fed up with my piece of cardboard because <laughs> some of the smaller ships were being blown around by the airbrush so using the fact that I already had magnets on the bottom of them was a was a bonus so I just quickly put them on this old tin lid and I was able to airbrush them without the fear of the uh, airbrush pressure blowing the little small ships around because they're magnetized onto here so great use of an old tin and uh, it really helped with the airbrushing. Because at this point actually the Vallejo primer is brilliant on those clear plastic printed shapeway ships uh, it really does grip so you know just a big plus point really for uh, 3d printed models that the paint does have a better sticking quality i don't know why but it, it just really does stick on to the uh, plastic printed ships more than it does the metal ones where it has more of a tendency to flake off slightly cleaner look now <laughs> compared to that haphazard way that i'd put them on there uh, this is the next day i gave them a sort of 24 hour period after doing that primering to make sure that it really cured and in fact the Vallejo guidance is to leave it overnight to make sure it's fully cured. 
and uh, that's the result. Just wanted to show you what they look like at this stage after they've had a primer. And uh, it's quite a thin primer as well as I haven't gone on too heavy, hopefully. This is the Forever Shipyards Free Trader, which I had printed for me from Shapeways. I don't own my own 3D printer, so fortunately that means you pay a bit of a premium for the Shapeway service, but having these delivered and they look so sharp, I'm pretty pleased with them as a, as a service, really, and saves me having to maintain my own 3D printer, although someday soon I'm going to have to invest. So this is the small ship's boat, again from the Foreven shipyard on Shapeways, and it's a nice clean model. It's very small though, and you know there's not much you can do with something like this. In fact, I probably went to town a bit too much on the paint job, which you'll see later, but I was quite pleased with the result. So here is everything ready to go for its next stage. It's been primed, and I'm almost ready to go, but I have a problem, and that's the primer is crumbling. So one interesting experiment I did, well I didn't want to experiment but ended up experimenting was I used this, and I've used this before plenty of times on plastic models and uh, resin models, which is the surface primer from Vallejo out of the airbrush as you could see in the video. And I also thinned it with a little bit of airbrush flow improver just to make sure that it didn't you know, clog up too much. So it's a little bit thinner by putting that into it. Uh, however, the models were all crumbly um, I let it dry for a full 12 hours, came back, and on some of these smaller ones, they were still just crumbling off. I was just taking my finger along the side with a, a, not a lot of pressure from the nail, and I could just see that black was coming off. Um, it hadn't really stuck. Now, interestingly enough, on the um, Traveller style models, the ones that came from Shapeways from the Forever store on Shapeways, this one included, the black primer actually stuck perfect. So these were printed on, these are sort of that 3D printed resin nylon-y plastic, um, and that was fine. So no problem at all to uh, spray that Vallejo onto, I know it works on plastics well as well, but all of these metal ones from your, um, you know, from the various ranges that I've got from Brigade Games and from GZG, these metal guys, it was all coming off. Um, so yeah, I went and switched to the Tamiya grey primer rather than the black. And over the course of two days, I gave them two coats of this, leaving 12 hours in between. And it was like a fine coat. It's fine. Um, uh, it's a fine surface primer anyway, that's what it's called. And it's like a light grey one, this one. So I've bought these in the UK for years and I just find them just brilliant for priming because it, it does result in a really tough finish. And if you mask onto this stuff, which when it first went on was just crumbling off really. I mean, it looked like a really good fine coat and you'll see that in the pictures that came up earlier, but um, it did all crumble off. I think I could have come back and done another coat of this, but I thought I've got all these ships in front of me. I don't want to put two coats of primer and find it's still crumbling. I've put them on these rulers. These rulers are available, um, metal steel rulers, available from Amazon for about £1.50. So. so in the booth here, you can see I've got the most of the bulk of the models are on this piece of cardboard down here, which I'm going to remove shortly so that I can just sort of pick them off one by one and put them onto the handle here for, for spraying for the larger ships. And for the smaller ships, I will be using the, the metal rulers just to to pop them on there and then airbrush them along um, and being able to maneuver them like this on the ruler means I can get sort of up around the edges. Paint wise, now I am experimenting a little bit but I I bought these Games Workshop air paints probably about a year ago now and therefore about time I started to give them a try I never tried them I thought I'll give those a go you know I only bought like a maybe six or so pots and I thought I'd give them a go but I do have the the Vallejo Game Air and Model Air uh, paints as well. So these have a notorious reputation, the Games Workshop Citadel paint pots. They're a little bit tricky to get stuff out, so I use a plastic pipette to transfer the paint into the reservoir of the airbrush. I did also put a couple of drops of airbrush flow improver in there. You can see that's the Vallejo one on the left of the uh, scene here. 
probably only put two or three drops of that in and it was very thin already so I didn't thin it down with any other acrylic airbrush mediums I just sort of directly airbrushed this stuff straight on and it was quite good nice solid yellow So you can see I'm whizzing around all the ships and just putting accents on. So I'm not covering the whole thing, going on quite lightly. Uh, pretty quick as well though, I'm not uh, spending a lot of time because I don't mind for if there's some oversplash uh, or overspray. As long as I go on nice and fine and I can then mask over these areas later because they're going to form an accent on the ship or a stripe rather than be the primary colour used on them. So this is the candy coloured stage where they look very bright with those base primer colours on. They will become the accents later on though as I mask off at different areas you'll see that the colours are actually more of an accent than the most dominant colour on there. Plus weathering and some later airbrushing where I darken them with some black ink will bring them down a bit again, particularly around the back of the ships because I'm going to darken the back around the uh, thrust and exhaust areas of the engine. The yellow, the green, uh, the orange and the red, they were all in that Citadel Games Workshop range of airbrush paints. This is actually a good example of one that's going to be quite dark and grey when it's done, but the accents on the side and on the front of those weapon pods do stand out a little when I've finally masked them and done another layer of airbrushing over there. And these two with their yellow sides. These are very chunky ships and they've got quite large panel lines. But I'm going to do a lighter colour on those, I think, when I finish them. This is the Liquitex acrylic medium. I used that in the airbrush. I mixed a few drops into all of the different colours that I used on this set here. It's just like an extra bond in the, in the paint. Plus it thins it to go through the airbrush. And that was the green colour I used, where you can see the green in use, the Vallejo one. And an almost still photo here for you to take a look at if you just wanted to see the different colours I've used and where I've sprayed the edges of the different craft. You can see quite a few of them have their primer still visible. So as if by magic I have the, the rest of the set here. You can see uh, if I get my face momentarily out of the frame you can see the uh, Cravac ships there which I've gone for the sort of orange on the side and I'm going for a, I've decided I'm going to use a, bar, a darker brown through the center um, so I'll be masking off some of the orange areas on there as well uh, but they'll have other accents that I'll paint on and again you can see with these ones I was painting red into the sort of grill areas with the airbrush going into there some overspray but I'll be masking off some of those grills and along the side here again and uh, more green along the side which will be used for accents along there so lots of masking to do from that the masking tape stage I've got a variety of these rolls of masking tape which I'm going to use to mask off a lot of the brightly coloured sections on the ships so that they're more like accents rather than dominating them and then I can go on with their base coats which are going to be a lot more neutral greys dark browns blacks very dark greys uh, in the mix so that and some light ones as well because I want to do that kind of lighter uh, you know almost like that Millennium Falcon style of pale whitish dirty looking old uh, merchant ships so I probably want a couple of those in the mix as well so I'll just show you all the different masking tapes I've got and how I use them pop down to the desk yeah, as you can see they're kind of brightly they look like candy pop kind of super bright colors now on here but all of these are kind of accents that i'm going to use on the ships the planning for this is basically that on some of them like like this uh, scout ship here oh, and the merchant trading one here as well they'll have you know different schemes not necessarily a camo scheme but definitely I was hoping to go for quite a sci-fi kind of black and yellow stripe of some kind on, on the Scout. But still leaving the majority of it will get a kind of a standard colour in there. Maybe some blacks and greys along the back here. 
So hopefully I'm not moving that around too much. And you can see the sort of level of detail and how I've airbrushed on. Like for example, this one, it's had a nice strong yellow, um, but then I'd also had some orange on there already that I'd went over on the yellow. A couple of GZG, three GZG little ships, and then these are GZG Cravac. All of the Cravac ones I've gone for kind of an orange theme and I was gonna give them a dark brown and orange. So this is some of the Jammy Dog stuff and material wise here, really you just need a Swan Norton or any other kind of super scalpel because you're, you're gonna be cutting and a cutting board like this so that you don't um, uh, score lines through uh, your desk. And you can get these cutting boards from Amazon as well. I, I, I really like them. These ones I've had for years, they're beginning to get a bit covered in, in junk, but they're still useful. Jammy Dog masking tape, uh, I'll cut a strip off put a section of it on there and then start to cut in different shapes and sizes. Some of it I'll just be putting down just as the neat little line of it that I'll stick on here. And then after you've stuck it down here, it, you peel it off and put it onto the uh, ships themselves. So, yep, so I'll get some of that out and then you can see it up close. You need to keep it under sort of a bit of tension on there. And then just sort of run my finger down doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line, it's just because I'm going to peel the sections off this afterwards. So at this point I could either use my blade or I could just scissor this off, which I'll just scissor a section off and make sure that's down. And over this side I've got some old stuff that's a bit of a mess if I zoom in there. Um, yeah, you can just see there's a bit of a mess over there, so just draw my line through. This is going to give me obviously some larger uh, coverage. So yes, yeah, so you can see straight away with that line, all I'm gonna do is just do generally about, um, probably about two centimeter, I don't know, do one and a half centimeter strips that or thereabouts. Uh, it, again, doesn't have to be perfect, but as I work through there, uh, some of it's dragging. Sort of various angled of angled sections of shapes here, which I know that I can then put on. Or just straight sections, just panel pieces. And again, um, I may do a few and then decide that I want to sort of come through those as well to make more like square sections too. I think realistically, the fighters are gonna get a lot of the really skinny pieces on them. And the bigger ships may have some more panel sections put on. So zoomed in super close there. Uh, we'll zoom out now so we can just see the situation. So I'll be taking some of these ships and I'll be considering where I want the uh, strips to be on. So I can see straight away, like with the red I've put on the wings here, that's an interesting accent. I might put some stripes down there. Also worth mentioning that I'm not going to be like a super careful person when I do it. You know, if I get some on, on that strip, maybe I'll put a stripe of the colour on the wing because I just want a couple of stripes on the wings. Um, as I was saying, these are just going to be accents rather than the main colour. So if I do put a stripe down there, a forward facing stripe there on that wing, and then use some skill in pushing it down or not skill as the case may be. So it's now over that section. Let's just bring that in so you can see it's all super close up and the folds will need to go underneath as just a simple sort of push down there will fold, fold it under. It will continue to keep moving a bit and uh, then handily, because it's on one of these little strips, I can then go onto the front as well and push that underneath. I actually don't mind if it's touching the bottom of the, uh, the plate there so you can do different ways of pushing down. I mean, for me, sometimes I use my finger, but really you just don't want to put too much pressure on. Um, you don't want to scratch the paint job in between. Yeah, so if, if things get stuck onto the, the ruler underneath, but at the same time it offers me some degree of safety for that, or extra stickiness, so that the, the tape doesn't just go and 
start to peel up because it's it's got to peel off the, the bottom first and then just push down very lightly I'm not I'm not pushing down hard I can see it is sort of the glues going on there you go that's straight away that gives you an idea that realistically I'm only going to have a couple of shaded stripes down there um, but I'm going to do another strip over the top of this sort of thruster not perfect but it's on as you can see well detailed in terms of ribbing along the top of it and we'll zoom in again just so you can see that super close up so I've let the tape go forward I was going to attempt to push the tape down to the front of this because it was a bit longer than required I say I didn't measure any of these out but that's just not going to hold um, with that small amount it will just keep peeling back and I push it down and then it's going to come creeping back so in fact that's that's fine from an airbrushing perspective yes there's going to be some that's going to go down the cracks here and there but I'm going to be left with generally a red stripe that starts to come off there's no <laughs> there's no intelligence behind this there, there's just me looking at it and going okay I'll, I'll stick a I'll stick a bit there and it looks good so you can see here that I've done a reasonable job of getting some masking tape. I haven't masked this back area here because this is going to go sort of a darker colour but then I'll maybe do a second line of masking on there after it's had um, like its overall colour applied. These ones I've just sort of put little stripes along there so they'll have kind of a yellow striping along the front which I'm quite keen on. Okay so back on to spray. I've mixed in the airbrush reservoir here a combination of USA Grey from Vallejo and some white white ink from Liquitex and then about 80-20 mix with the airbrush medium from Liquitex and then for the rear engines I actually went back over by mixing in some black ink back in again to the uh, raw USA grey from the the dark at the tip on the scout through to the paler grey at the back and these guys are all sort of pale grey so that's the general theme. Of course, what's going to happen is that when I do the next level of detail painting, I'll pick out things like the hard points in maybe a different shade. Little tiny raised panels may get some extra detail. And they're going to get some panel lining done as well. But here they are, ready for the sort of grand, grand reveal, really. So if I just make a tiny tweak to this, and you can see what's going on. This will zoom out again in a minute. I just wanted to make sure they're central. Oh, and tool-wise, I'm using a tri-tool from Hasagawa. It's basically the, uh, you'll see it as I go in close again now. Um, it doesn't lock in on this zoom, but you can see the end of it. It's just very flat and, and you get really good control there from this Hasagawa tri-tool. And it's, it's actually for decals, but it's just as easy to pull off this stuff here. So straight away I can see, because I didn't have that completely flat down, I've got some greys going onto the red underneath. No big deal for me because these, are, these aren't designed to be, um, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on these, but these aren't meant to be sort of showcase grade paint, especially at this size as well. But I can see the two stripes coming in on the side. And um, keep keep working is the idea. Yeah, yeah. Towards the back there, the red's a bit stronger, where you can see that the the tape has gone on, and it's revealing that there's like that ribbed line on the detailing there, which I'm quite pleased with. Yeah. And then I know there's just a sort of a pale cream section at the front underneath the. I mean that doesn't really show up, but it's a slight, a slightly different colour at the front, very, very vaguely. <laughs> it's fine for me. So the scout ship, let's uh, let's get stuck in. Ooh, nice sharp contrast on that one. Hmm, that's nothing clean too. This is showing you really here that you can't paint this kind of level of sharpness. You can attempt it, and I'm sure with some epic levels of practice you could, but 
when you're doing this large volume of them as well, it, it does speed things up. So you may have thought earlier on, this guy's crazy doing all this masking tape. It takes me five minutes to splash some paint on, do a bit of dry brushing, a couple of stripes of color, bosh, I'm done. But actually, when you're doing like 40 ships like this, it's surprisingly quick and the paint jobs kind of almost do themselves. As you can see here, a couple of airbrushes on this, if I was doing it on its own, would have been a very quick process. You can see how the black at the front's giving it that waspish stripe, and then it leads into a much less striking uh, level of contrast towards the back with some orange that was also in the spray. So with a Traveller Free Trader here, I used the red colour, mostly underneath and then masked on top of the red before spraying on a kind of lighter grey really on top, almost too white. If I look at myself here now and look at this and I think actually maybe I probably want it a bit heavy with the airbrushing, I can see that even peeling these off that there's quite a lot of paint on top. And you can also see it's not, it's never perfect as well when you're speeding through things like this. Perfection would mean me spending many many weeks potentially on one ship which would just be really terribly hard work to uh, when you're trying to get the fleet and a majority of things done there's a sort of a level that I'm working towards in terms of quality which I'm quite happy with you see with masking tape with this stuff it's it, it is really tricky to take off and what I found later on is that I ended up with lots and lots of hidden bits that I discovered later actually later on even near doing the the matte dull coat at the end of this whole operation I was still finding little bits of masking tape that that had become almost like sections of the ship so worth having a, a magnifying glass around to try and find some because at this scale it's quite hard to uh, to spot them all so I used a mix there of sometimes using the blade to give me a lip to be able to pull the tape off and then flipping to the Hasegawa Tritool tweezers. I mean, any good brand of tweezers will do, but these ones are particularly good for removing tape or even applying decals and things as well. The primer and the paint that went on and then leaving them for a good overnight for the paint, the airbrush paint to cure, has meant that I haven't had any come off with um, removing the paint everything's come off really clean even on these metal ones like this one here from brigade models the masking tape is on there nice and cleanly and it, and it peels off without causing any damage that bit there has a couple of layers actually of, of masking tape and I obviously just started it and then I switched over here to doing the nice uh, yellow stripes down the side just removing some of the junk from my fingers gets everywhere that masking tape. Back onto the Hasegawa Tritor. So this entire section now of removing the tape I've just sped up so that uh, it'll pass a bit quicker. If you want to pause at any point you can do and just see where I've put the paint on. You can see actually where some of the paint hasn't uh, gone on as well as it could have done underneath the masking because I hadn't put my initial coat on as well as it could have been. Uh, particularly in those grills, there's maybe little front sections where either the the grey has sprayed over when because the tape wasn't on strong enough, and uh, the little go faster stripes have ended up with uh, additional grey being flooding underneath the tape. But on those ones in particular, these brigade model ships, the those grills are, are rather nice targets for masking because you can get a really nice sharp colour in there. Of course, this all could be painted as well. It's just the technique I went for was to, to use the masking because it gets me a nice sharp edge. And uh, you can see that also I've sprayed some dark black on there, which has gone over. So these are the ones that look a little bit like uh, watermelons, but uh, you can see I just use them as accents with large sections of diamonds and triangle shape masking tape. Being smaller ships, you can be, well, I guess a little bit more frivolous in terms of colours and paints, uh, just to make them look a little bit brighter and interesting. I think they end up looking a bit like a school of uh, tropical fish, actually, when you see them on the, on the table. But uh, it's quite fun. And also, because I hadn't painted any spaceships, I mean, 
I haven't done starships for 10 years properly. So I was experimenting and I think, you know, it's fun to do that as well. To sort of go, okay, maybe I won't get quite the scheme that I want out of this, but I'm playing around. I end up doing a technique that surprises me and I'll, I'll learn something from it. So, you know, have some fun really with it. With this smaller ship that's got two missile pods on the side from Brigade models, and I gave them a very bright yellow towards the front to, to highlight those pods. And there's also kind of hatches towards the front, which I paint up later on. This is a GZG model, and the cylinders on the side are a perfect opportunity to, to paint some different panelling on there. In retrospect on this one, I think I should have done a higher contrast, so the blue and the grey are a bit too subtle. But they look nice, and, and when the decals go on there, because again, having that nice cylindrical space there, you can stick a nice decal on the side and it makes it look interesting, sort of distracts from the uh, paint job a little bit too. Put quite a large dark area across the central spine of the, the long ship there. I struggled with the long one a little bit compared to some of the others. It wasn't my favorite design after all, but uh, I did lighten up those weapon hard points, the four of them in the central column of that ship in the end, and, and they look pretty good. I mean, overall, I was happy with the fin finished results. Made a little chip on that one as I was removing the, the uh, masking tape there on the front of it, but otherwise it, it did okay. That one there, lesson on this one really was that the contrast, contrast wasn't really high enough between the, the masked paint that was like that light green underneath and then the light grey on top. In the end it just does like a, a strange pattern. Uh, I think I could have done a darker hull and the contrast would have looked a little bit better. And yeah, as I was saying, the central spine on this, despite having some bright green sort of accents and stripes as you can see, it just didn't work for me. I, it was one of those ones I felt failed. But end result, quite happy with. Just uh, during the process, it just didn't quite work out. But I was experimenting with all of these, just trying different schemes, seeing if some of them worked out and some of them didn't. And, uh, and this one didn't, but also the ship didn't. It didn't grow on me. <laughs> So here I'm using the Liquitex acrylic medium. It's a very watery airbrush medium that they do, which I found very useful. Gives me a good finish, a slightly satin finish. And then the Liquitex burnt umber ink, which has been mixed with it, about half and half. I'm mixing the reservoir. That's actually recommended mixing in these reservoirs on the iWater website. And it's part of the idea is that paints are a little bit awkward moving them around, getting them into the reservoir allows you to mix it in there, but a lot of the pros and a lot of other people recommend mixing your paints before you drop them into the reservoir. I do a mix of both, sometimes if I've got a, an old clogged up paint, which I know that I can thin down enough to go through an airbrush, I'll do it in a separate pot to avoid putting in a thick paint. But with this ink and with that medium that's splashing all over the place there, uh, I will do that in the reservoir. So once in there, I'll get an old brush and I'll just stir them up when I find which brush, there it is over the back, and mix that up so it gets the medium mixed in. The medium looks a bit pale whitish, but it's clear really. It's, uh, it's kind of like a resiny type thing that gives it a really nice solid finish. But because the ink's transparent, it means that it's not gonna fully cover everything anyway. So if you go on subtly, you can avoid you know, super covering up what colour you had on there already and, and it gives it more of a kind of a burnt out look. So that's what I'm using over the sort of rear engine parts of many of the ships here. So because it's an ink, you get that really nice transparency. It means you can sort of go over any of the dark areas on the back that you want to, or what you're going over some of the light areas to darken them and give them a kind of a dirty exhaust look. It takes away that very flat colour look that I've got after I've done the initial masking and then revealing the, the paint underneath. So I'm just trimming the edges of these really to uh, give them that darkened exhaust. It's also going all over my fingers. So it's quite a subtle result really. I don't want to go too heavy on this, just around the back of the exhaust areas, just where those thrust maneuver drives are on the engines, just putting a little bit on there. Same applies to these other ones as well to darken them down. And these ones are quite pale because I've gone for a pale blue 
colour on these, so spraying the, the dark brown ink across the back there will darken the exhaust nicely. I'm going to do that all across the back of this whole range of ships. So everything's out and ready. I have my wet palette before me here, which is just some tracing paper. I mean, there's lots of guides on making these yourselves. I just bought this uh, particular brand because it was a nice handy case. It has an elasticated um, thing that kind of seals it all back together. I like to keep the, the, the seal airtight on there. And then I've got some Liquitex paints, which I'm using, and my old Privateer Press, uh, which has gone a bit thick, but... Um, yeah, because it's an older, an older paint and it's had a new top on there. You can see a brand new top that I've put on because the old tops harden. Yeah, that goes onto the wet palette too. So I put them all on there. Petrol air. The spaceships are ready to go on my stand here as well. Uh, the only other thing is uh, my brushes. Tamiya Modeling Brush Pro. And I've got a size 00. zero. And a size, well, they just call it HG there. It's a very tiny, it's like a zero, zero, zero nib here. Yeah. So I will tend to just pick one or two pots of these out, put them on the desktop, and then I'm sort of ready, ready to go really from there. Um, so that's my setup for painting. And I just thought I'd run through that uh, as part of this so that you can see where I'm doing all this work. So basically I've got my iron hull gray and I've got it on the palette down here mixed in with some white. I've got my mixing medium, which is quite thick, but also some water. I've got my scenic sprayer. This is a handy pump spray. It's great to just be able to trickle out some water from that um, occasionally there too, just as I'm working through. So basically with this gray, which I've just vaguely matched, but highlighted up a bit on what I've got, you can see I'm just going around the edges, but quite a heavily laden brush, but you know, I just wipe a little bit of it off and then find an edge like the edge of this here and then hold the brush in at an angle, hold the model up to get the, the, the right angle so that I'm just um, heading along the edge there rather than picking out um, a whole panel. I'm just edging the panel. And of course, this is just something you can't do with an airbrush or anything like that, it's, you know, be the masking attempt effort would be, would be huge, but by just sort of pulling the, the brush along the edge, I'm, I'm highlighting up the panel lines. The odd imperfection in there is okay. Some of the sections are a little bit harder, like when you've got a near flat panel on the top, you've got, just got to be careful you're not sort of so, for example, on that one there, I'm going to pick a bit more of the paint up and uh, cover in a whole sort of side angle of it. So as to highlight quite a lot of that uh, got a nearly clean clean white here now on the brush so that I can just pick out a couple of edge sections there and I can streak down like that so you can see and some bits go over more than once just because you know I nearly match the colour just by eye really the iron hole grey mixed with some white and that means I've got some wiggle room like I was saying if I make a mistake so I'm using the brush to do the mixing on there and just make sure that I clean the brush instantly after doing that and what I find I do is I'm terrible for not finishing one section, so if I can't, I'll jump around uh, to wherever I want to go. Just a quick zoom in on progress there. 
and you can see that the sharpening up of the edges is having a reasonable effect of uh, adding and making that detail pop a little bit more. Refreshing the wet palette. It's basically a piece of blotting paper and then tracing paper on top and through the magic of osmosis it pulls the moisture through to keep the paint wet. Same treatment on this one here on the Scout. I'm working my way around the edges but I'm starting out I'm just strengthening some of the yellow in a couple of spots just where I hadn't put the paint on as strong through the airbrush and it just sort of cleans it up a little bit. It's getting the same edge panelling treatment again as the other models, so some iron hull grey mixed with varying levels of white to highlight up areas like the manoeuvre drive on the back there. And you can see I'm not really taking an awful lot of care, I'm just sort of painting it on. I do actually then highlight up to give that an edge as well. And then I work a, an edge around all the areas around the back. So it's a second highlight. I'm not doing any gradation at all on here. There's no gradient in the painting. It was just a sort of iron hull grey, then a little bit more white. And you can see it really gives it a, a sharp, almost sort of white edge, although it's still slightly grey. And I'm doing that against every section on the back that just highlights up as if there's some light coming from above. Uh, again, there's nothing scientific about that though, just to highlighting those edges and then from a distance it looks uh, okay. But later on, of course, it's going to get a pin wash and darken down a little bit, so the whole thing will even out and look less sharp when it's finished. And then a highlight along the edge as well, so I've just used that pale whitish grey and I've worked all the way around the edge. In fact, I took time here to also mix in some yellow for the highlights on the yellow bands around the edge. But actually it wasn't needed. You, you could have just used a white uh, or a lightest grey all the way around the edge of the entire ship. In fact, in some places I do look, I've just gone a, all over the uh, edges that had the more orangey uh, colour to them as well. Just realised my water pot's very brown and needs a flush. <laughs> uh, it's just normal clean tap water I use in there and uh, I've probably been painting here for an hour or so and it's got a bit dirty and needs a clean. I do do some of the interior panels and edge a couple of them but I'm not going over every panel on here that would just be wasted time and there's also a gradient from the airbrushing I've done on there just naturally where I've uh, not got a sharp edge it's running from the black through to the whiter back and because of that I don't need to panel line every one of those and the pin washing which you'll see as a later stage will make all those panels more apparent. So actually painting every edge isn't required and saves you a lot of time as well as you'll see later when I pin, pin wash them. So both the Scout and this Free Trader model here from Fort Evans Shipyards on Shapeways both had a little bit more extra treatment as you can see here. I just took a little bit more time definitely with the scheme as well and, and um, putting the masking tape on there. And I'm edging this one to start, but after the edge lines, which I'm doing, I also go on to clean up some of the reds where the, the underspray of the grey that's managed to get under the tape has discoloured some of the, the brighter colours. Although I'm not spending again hours and hours on that, I'm just making sure they're just a little bit sharper and cleaned up. And it's surprising how these edge lines really... Uh, show up some detail that you wouldn't normally see. I mean, just around that grill at the very back of the ship, just a couple of lines down there just make that area suddenly appear, whereas the eye normally casting across there might miss that detail. And because it's such nice fine level of quality of these uh, spaceships that have been printed by Shapeways, you know, I just thought I'd take that extra time to, to detail them up. Technique-wise and lessons for me here really on both the Scout and this ship, and, and all the others in the Brigade range that I was doing, where I had darker airbrushing, even if it left a sort of gradient, like at the back of the engine there, if I did a nice clean panel edge, it really did sharpen up the definition. So those exhausts on the back with a little bit of highlight on them, even though it's a kind of a bit rough and ready, and then the trim around the, the whole back section really did sharpen up that detail and I was quite pleased with the result. It does require the, the next couple of stages that go on with the pin washing and 
some weathering, but that nice clean edge, although probably not necessarily realistic, um, it does actually really sharpen the, very, the rear end of this uh, very nice ship. So as with the Scout, I just used a second lighter colour of grey. There's no gradients, it's just one darker grey and then a lighter edge, and you can see how it's trimmed up and given some definition right across the back of the ship there. If you've got a keen eye here, you can see I've left a bit of masking tape on. I do spot it later, later on in the process, but at the moment I don't spot there's a remaining piece of masking tape. And now I see it zoomed in here with the camera, which is better than my eyes. I'm starting to spot some of the issues. But yeah, I've mixed up some purple here, which is another privated press colour. And I'm just going on with some water and mixed with the mixing medium as well. Again, I'm using the Liquitex mixing medium and it just thins down that purple to make it easier to paint on. What it does mean though is that you tend to have to go on twice uh, with the thinness of this paint and you can see I'm just going in and painting all of those hatches which must be kind of missile launch hatches just to highlight where they are and that's the kind of motif or extra detail I've done on all of this range where I've done them in that green and grey if there's any details, I've tended to highlight them with a bit of purple. This is the most painting, actually, interesting that I've did on all of the ships. So the airbrushing really did speed things up. But when it came to these, I thought I need to show these somehow as uh, weapon points of some kind, as hard points, whatever you want to call them. And it was worth taking the time, I think, because the final result in the end, it just gave them a little bit of extra detail. After that purple's done, I'm just back on doing the edging again, which is the same as all the other ships, just slightly picking up a, a lighter grey and working around the, the larger panel edges. But, uh, you know, not covering every single panel, but certainly working my way around. Those little thin areas on the side, they do have some recessed uh, design and texture on the edge, and that comes out later on with the pin wash. You can start to see the edges of that too. So. At this point, it's not really revealing that detail to me, even with the edge highlights, but the pin wash will reveal that later. I do actually complete a little second highlight on the purple by just mixing the purple with some white to create a slightly more pinky tone, which I just work around. Um, and it looks like I'm taking a lot of care, but really I'm just speeding through this bit to, to blob it on because I know the pin wash later will disguise any uh, extra sharp bits that I've put on where I've maybe put too much highlight or not not been as good as and careful as I need to be with the brush but that edge highlight again it's nicely revealed the engine at the rear and the when I say engine I mean the exhaust <laughs> and uh, the nice fin edges too but it's, it's a nice ship I like this one a lot I wish I had about four or five of them now but you know it was good to get the the basics done on there and uh, and complete it Brigade models do a great job of scaling down these ships to the smaller sizes in the range. So you lose a couple of fins, you lose some weapon hard points, but then you get a, uh, you know, this one looks more like a little mini tugboat of a ship, but the uh, with a single exhaust on the back there. But I'm giving it the same sort of care in terms of just edge lining it. And it also has some nice fine details, recesses along the, just about where the brush is on the left there. And that'll come out with the pin washing later on. So it doesn't need a lot of work here in terms of just doing the edges with the zero zero brush. Because I recorded all this footage as I painted right from start to finish, I can see that a ship like this was taking about eight minutes or 10 minutes or so to do. And then obviously I've sped it up for this quick shot here and you can just see myself working around there. But that's a reasonable indicator on ships of this size. Now the other thing here, I'm taking some care because I've got just the one on the magnetic mount as I paint, but earlier on I was also skipping through several ships at once on the rulers. This next ship which has the sort of two rocket bays or missile bays on the side, same treatment again, edge panelling, and then I put some purple details. And in fact on those recesses on the side pods, I actually put the purple in there fully Rather than just trusting to the pin wash later on, I thought I'll darken off the recesses on the side pods to uh, show them off. 
So that's me just putting the finishing touches to the darker purple. Again, keeping it in theme with the rest of the ships using the same purple colour, uh, but in a different location on there. So that's the set that I did in one sitting. So I felt like I'd give you the full paint process with these. So well done for watching the paint dry. So before the next step where some decals go on here and then some weathering as well, I just finished every ship in the collection here that I was painting to this standard, which is just to sort of edge light them uh, against the panels and then put some highlighted details like that purple on the, on the different components. But there was very little extra painting to do really. It was mostly down to the airbrushing. I'm using the camera to take some photos here. So you'll notice it will go still for a moment. So if you pause at the moment that it's still, you'll get a really sharp image because there won't be any movement in the frame. Just another review here of getting in super close to the detail so you can see the paintwork and, and how it's coming on. In fact, they're pretty good right now, but if you look at that one at the end, it does need its panel lines uh, weathering with some pin washes on the free trader. The rest actually you could get away with just saying I'm done, but uh, some pin washing to pull out the details even more is definitely of value on these, as you'll see later on. And through careful inspection, I was able to find the little piece of masking tape which I missed earlier, <laughs> now removed. So yeah, believe it or not, that happened right up until I was doing the, the matte dull coat. At the end, I found one last piece of masking tape, which is hopefully the last one hidden away. So this is my decal box. I use them for a variety of different modelling for my 15mm scale miniatures for the Grunts war game. Plus I use them here from on my side of my ships. Uh, the range is basically mostly from Bandai for their Gundam miniatures. And that makes them really sharp and clean for use on any, any scale really. From 15mm, 28mm, anything you like even though Gundam is generally in the sort of 1 144th or the 1 100th scale. And I get them on eBay. So they tend to be imported. They come from Japan, some of them from China. You can see the sort of style of them you get. Some of them are symbols, some of them are those kind of hatch warning signs. Obviously, some are far too big. But I'm happy to mix them on, even though there's probably some people in the Gundam world that are thinking you know, sacrilege to use a symbol for some particular Gundam series uh, on the side of a ship that doesn't have any canon relationship uh, to it, but I'm happy. They're just symbols, and, you know, the more of them I add on, sometimes the nicer they are. And some are really tiny, which surprises me, because you wouldn't even see them on a 144th scale model. But those ones are particularly nice, the grey ones. And what I tend to do is spend like this 10, 15 minutes going through my box of different symbols. And in fact, these are Infinity, the uh, 28mm skirmish game Infinity. And I'm using some of those on there as well because they have some nice sort of oriental small symbols. In fact, there's really small symbols at the top there. You can't even see what the, what the logo is, but it just looks interesting and will contrast against the ship's hull. And that's me. You can see I've cut them up. Oh, and Fighting Piranha Graphics. They do a range which are for Battletech, so they have the Battletech symbols and, and logos for the various factions. I can see a World of Blake image down there. And that last one there, which has OCL, I believe that's an American freight company. And, uh, and Maersk obviously is a freight company as well, so sometimes I'll use those on the side of a, a ship that could be a transport ship or something and just add what's a commonly known logo to the side of uh, a sci-fi setting. So I've cut out all the different decals that I like, or decals, 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 you choose. And then I just leave them in this water tray. In fact, it's the lid of my wet palette. And I just pour some plain water in there and then leave them. <laughs> well, only for about a couple of minutes. And, and then, as you can see, I use a brush to pull them out and then drop them on. I usually use a longer brush like this. I just happen to have one with a very long bristles <laughs> brush. And that means that I can sort of manipulate them. You can see they're very tiny little square one going on. Some of those you don't really see, but I think the cumulative effect 
of adding a few of them on, especially on these uh, nice traveller ships, just adds to them. And, and you're never going to really look at one individually, but when you look at the ship as a whole and, and a couple of ships beside each other, and these tiny details are over hatches or pointing out uh, uh, to exhausts or warning signs, the final result's quite nice. <laughs> it's a terrible job of me, a bad example of uh, how to add a decal by a, uh, a guy that doesn't know what he's doing. But if you've got plenty of water on the brush and also you, you put them on with plenty of water, you get that manoeuvre time, which could be, you know, 10 to 20 seconds really before the water's dried off or you get to shift it around. And then the only other thing I would do is um, add some microsol to them that melts them onto the hull, which is the next step after this. So uh, basically I took all these ships into the lounge on their rulers, uh, watched a bit of TV with my wife, and while I was sat there I was using the microsol, which is the flattener, which flattens these down and it lo they lose their edge and they almost look like they're painted on. I mentioned earlier just how good this GZG ship is with the cylindrical containers on the side. It means just an idle location. I actually did think about putting some graffiti on the side, but I didn't bother. And again, just more of these tiny panel notifiers and, and arrows on the side of this ship. So I wanted to show you again using the Burnt Umber ink mixed with Liquitex airbrush mixing medium. I think it's about 80-20 mix that I put in there. And uh, mixing it in the airbrush, the Iwata M1 airbrush reservoir. Don't need much because uh, this is after I've put the decals slash decals on and it's me dirtying up the engines and some points on the ships just to sort of uh, tone them down and weather them a bit so that some of that panel lining is not as sharp, particularly around the rear ends of them. Uh, and again, not, not a great lid for pouring on top of this, so so just using an old brush again. As I mentioned earlier on, I tend to just mix in the lid, although you can mix separately, but you then have to decant into here afterwards. So if you look on all the Iwata uh, official websites, they do say you know the reservoirs are a place where you can mix. If you use a soft brush on there, it's fine. In fact, even a, a cocktail stick, as long as you're not prodding it into things in there, is fine. So these ones that we've just shown having the decals put on the back uh, are now going to get some of this darker colour and I'm going to really be gentle with the spray but it, it will have some overspray because you can see there's no masking going on. I'm just going along the back engines and some delicate overspray will be happening onto the rear ends to dirty up like exhaust. So this is a real key stage. Mecha varnish, which is a gloss varnish from Vallejo, any of their gloss varnishes will do. Uh, they've just labelled that one Mecca because it goes with the Mecca paints which are also slightly glossy. And then some of the airbrush thinner mixed into a few uh, drops of that um, airbrush flow improver too on top of that varnish to, to mix it together. And why am I doing this? Well you do it because you need a gloss finish on the ship to do the pin washes. You don't have to but if you do do it the capillary action of putting a small drop of oil into one of the panel lines will spread that oil much further when it's gloss. And the gloss finish also protects your decals and everything else on there, really seals everything in so that the next stage when you're handling them uh, means you're not going to lose any paint or, or damage anything. But mostly it's to improve the capillary action when you're doing a pin wash, just makes it a lot easier. Because I take my time and sort of schedule in a couple of hours one evening and then leave it for the next day, what I do with these is I sprayed them all, the entire selection of ships that I've got, and then I left them for a day. It may have been actually a couple of days before I came back and did the next stage. It just means that the uh, varnish is going to really cure. Even though it probably takes about 24 hours to cure, I don't mind leaving it a little bit longer. So you can see them here in their gloss state. And it's an interesting moment because whenever I do a pin wash and something's looking a bit glossy, sometimes I think, actually, I like the gloss <laughs> and I want to keep the modelling gloss. But, you know, generally speaking, the reflection of light off them uh, means that the gloss doesn't look that great because you're going to look at some areas that might you want to represent as dark and they're going to flash up as bright because the, the gloss varnish is uh, reflecting whatever lights around you. Decals are hidden underneath there. I've added the microsol 
which is a decal flattener, comes in a little red jar, which means that it's flattened off all of those decals to make them look like they're almost painted on. In fact, I put about three coats of that on, sat in front of the TV in the lounge, and uh, just worked my way around all of them, letting the Microsoft dry on the decal and then painting it on again. And it's just like a, a lighter fluid or something. It's very thin and it evaporates very quickly, but you'll see the decals flatten more and more every layer of Microsoft that you add. And that went on before they were varnished with the gloss varnish. So pin washing is the next stage. I'll just shuffle this lot out of the way and get my oil washes out, well my oil paints, which I'm going to use to do the pin washes. So here we have my old tin of oil paints, some of which are 20 plus years old, but they still last. And that's one thing, if you invest in a, in a few oil paint colours, um, burnt umber, lamp black, and Payne's grey are probably all you need, but over the years I've had different techniques and I've invested in different oils while I've been doing modelling and painting, so I've ended up with quite a collection, but so it has taken me potentially up to 25 years. Some of these are really old. That one's lost its cap. <laughs> it's been stored in there and it's lost its cap. And what happens is, you know, with this really old stuff like that, Alkid oil there, I've had about 20 years, and um, the cap's got a bit tough on there. But it's quite easy to sort of pick the plug out of the top if the uh, if the cap's busted off and then and still use it. And as they say, with old oil paintings, I think it's something like three to four hundred years before the oil's properly dry. So um, I'm just saying it's only going to take me about another 300 years before I, I finish these. So subscribe to the channel. <laughs> I'll be back in a few hundred years when the models are dry. But until then, you can watch the process continue with what I've got here. So for this little set, I've settled on Payne's Grey and some white. And you need some of this odorless turpentine, or you can use the odorful turpentine. Either way, it's still good stuff, which will thin down the paint so it becomes a nice wash that you can pin wash. I've always been a fan of the military modelling magazines, the 135th scale, where they finally craft these amazing military historical vehicles and modern vehicles as well. And if they're using oils, one technique they often show is to put it on a bit of tissue paper and then maybe even leave it for uh, a few hours or a, a short period of time that it will absorb then the linseed oil out of the oil paint, meaning that you're going on to the figure with less of the, oil, the, the linseed oil carrier and it means they dry a bit quicker. I don't actually care about that at all. <laughs> at this size, I'm putting it on some tissue paper, but it's just because it's a handy place to sort of decant it out of the tube first before I, I mix it in one of those little shot plastic glasses. Because these ships are so small, and, and most of the modelling and painting that I do where I use pin washes are quite small vehicles, I'm not too worried about the, the showcase standard that people would go to, to to make sure the linseed oil is out of there. But you know, as I say, I'm decanting it onto a piece of tissue paper, so there's bound to be a bit of the oil um, absorbed out of it onto the paper. And then the white's going on there as well too. I probably should really use a bit of tissue to clean the oil paint from the top of the tube. It gets a bit messy if you don't, and that's what's ruining the lids on these for me. So that's a, a tip there, pro tip. Clean the top of your oil paints like I failed to do. So how to come I selected Payne's Grey and White? instead of what's the classic mix for a pin wash, which is some variation on burnt umber through to lamp black for a really sharp, distinct uh, pin wash. Well, the reason for that is because these are so small, if I went for a really high contrast, I'd end up looking as if I had sort of black lines painted over these craft. So my view was a bit of white mixed with some Payne's Grey, and Payne's Grey is like a, it's almost got a sort of bluey purpley tone to it, um, but it is a grey and transparent as well. But mixed with white, the two colours came together in something that wasn't quite as stark a contrast for me. And that's just a bit of experimentation I've done on smaller scale models like this. I like to use the lighter wash. So things get a bit awkward when I'm filming because I'm sort of decided there to decant out some of the turpentine into one of the small shot glasses, the plastic shot glasses, but then I've left the lid off the turpentine ready to spill at any moment. Luckily I didn't spill it, but typically I'd get that out of the way 
and then the shot glasses in front of me would be for mixing. And also I'd keep one of the shot glasses with clear terps in ready to clean the brush. But you can see that purpley blue of the panes grey and then the white giving it a slightly more milky look. And this stage is worth taking a little bit of time on, which is just using an old brush with the terps and then going round and round to, to blend them together. And you know, if you don't do it, you'll end up with a big lump of oil paint um, in the middle of your wash, which you don't want. So you want to thoroughly mix it up with the terps. So why am I not using a Nolan oil or a Griffin sepia? or a contrast wash or any other kind of acrylic army painter type uh, dark shades or, or light shades and the reason for that is with oils you can remove them with the terps and you'll see later on just how easy that is especially with the gloss varnish that's gone onto these removing overspill of the oil is very easy so just showing you here that i use the winsor and newton oil colors that's the zinc white and also the Payne's Grey that's gone on there. And the two together are great for a perfect kind of mix to, to darken it off. And you can see where I've got that in there. I've, I've spent a good couple of minutes just mixing them together so that I've got a, a wash. And also whilst you're doing this, it's worth giving it the occasional little uh, spruce up with maybe adding another drop or two of terps and then just stirring it around as well and you want it to a, a really thin consistency so that it's going to use its capillary action to go into the panel lines but the gloss varnish on there will also help and there I am just starting filling those tiny dot holes up and actually although I take care I don't mind if I make a bit of an overspill here and there because I can clean that off afterwards and it's quite a subtle result Some places it really traces through nicely. It's almost like an, an immediate um, uh, capillary shot of oil wash that goes along the panel lines. And then others, it just needs a little bit more coaxing uh, to highlight that area. And again, it looks like I'm doing a lot of detailed work here, but I feel this is a very quick technique. In fact, it's, it's almost like, you know, to me, compared to trying to actually darken these areas off by hand painting them it's it's like a thousand times faster uh, when you're doing the entire set at one time but there you go you can see a tiny bit of overspill there and that'll be tidied up later on so it doesn't matter if you make the odd mistake if you've not got the perfect control and that was a very pleasing piece of capillary action there and that one is too so just occasionally you get a really good shot where the the pin wash will make its way all the way through the panel line one observation on these ships from uh, the for Evan shipyards and printed by Shapeways from their store on there is that the panel lines on that particular scout are superb. They've kind of got that kind of depth to them. But the panel lines on the uh, Free Trader there that's at the top of the screen are much finer and it was a lot harder to get the um, oil on and I needed to clean it up more as well because I ended up with overspill. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is I went in a bit heavy with the white uh, out the airbrush, so I lost some of the panel lines. But more importantly, I think they are just finer detailed panel lines compared to this scalp, where you've got almost the perfect, maybe half mil size panel line, which just means it's going to work when you do the pin wash. It's not going to overspill as much as uh, some of the finer lines on the Free Trader did. So if you think this probably takes around about two to five minutes, I'd say possibly you could do it in two to three minutes per ship. It's not much of an investment in time for this stage. Once you've put that gloss on, you're just whizzing around with the, the panel line and you're not having to use um, too much artistic skill because you're just controlling the brush when it drops into those areas. And as I said, in the moment, you'll see I use some Q-tips from Tamiya and some neat terps to just pull that off afterwards. Quite fun doing it, I actually really enjoy it. And I know again, people may say that I'm going too far, taking too much time, but I just enjoy doing a pin wash and, and letting it trace its way into the details. And as this dries, because the other thing is while it's, it's wet, it's quite glossy in there as well, it'll dry off quite matte and that dulls down the whole effect too, so the, the contrast is reduced. 
as I say, do do think about going for this Payne's grey and white combination, which is less striking than a lamp black wash or, or a burnt umber. And also burnt umber brings in a lot more brown. And I think because these are starships, I wanted to go for sort of a darker greyish look. And it was just about the right level of uh, darkness mixing in that Payne's grey and white. There's a kind of a ladder type thing there. And you can see it kind of flooded its way in. Plus this area here, which I, was, I believe at the front, um, those tiny indentations are sort of where the, the bridge is behind those uh, areas. And as I mentioned before, this one a little bit more tricky because the panel lines were so fine and I think I put too much um, paint on these. You know, it had a couple of layers of uh, primer plus the whites I highlighted up towards the front and I think I filled in the panel lines. But in a moment after you see that overspill of that panel line, that will be cleaned up and look a lot more subtle when I've done the removal of the overspill using the Q-tips combined with a bit of uh, neat terps on there. So these are a lot easier to do with the recessed panel areas. You know you're going to have less chance of overspill because you're just dropping the wash into those areas there and just letting it work its way around with your capillary action again, pulling the paint through the panel lines in there for you. So it makes it nice and easy. You're not having to sort of spread it over everything. But even if you do get it overspilled into the recesses, you can get that off later on. Or it will just light up weathering as well and those sections are nice and easy. In fact, interestingly enough, I felt when this was finished, having those recessed areas on the top of the hull filled with the pin wash really did um, make them pop and give it a kind of an extra sense of scale and definition. So just showing my Tamiya Modeling Brush Pro again, 000 in size, which is what I'm using to put this pin wash on. You could go smaller, but being a 000, you get um, potentially more paint on the brush so that the capillary action will draw it off, rather than if you had a really tiny, fine brush, it might give you a little bit more control and less overspill, but you're going to have less of the oil paint on there. And you can see again on these, the panel lines on these small brigade model ships mean that it's pulling that ink in. So you can see up close there how it's lined out those panels. And I can see a, a blue tint on there, which will be more visible when you uh, see this after it's got its matte dull coat on right at the end of the process. But yeah, just going on just about everywhere with that. And it will be a nice little shade in different areas on the ship and it will give it more definition which I think you can see already uh, given that they had the highlighted edges on as well and then followed with the oil wash. Just mention again really that by not using the lamp black and the burnt umber really dark colours it just makes this a little bit more subtle and I can see my mix probably had a little bit more of the the white in with the Payne's grey there on, on these smaller ships but it was really more by accident than by design. But the final result is that it's not as high a contrast, but it actually does look quite nice in terms of scaling these ships without making them look like a, almost like a black and white with the panel lines, which would be too high contrast. So I'm speeding through this set here and actually not taking as much care as I had been before. because I've started sort of motor on through them. I'm, uh, just sort of nearly splashing it all over as you can see towards the front there. Also my mix of oil is 
a little bit lighter so there's less worry about it uh, really messing up the model. But what you see in a minute when I move on to the removal stage of uh, cleaning up this oil paint once it's dried for two or three minutes uh, you'll see that it, it does clean up really really well and that's one of the most effective things about this technique is that any overspill or mess you make will get tidied up and the whole thing neatens up very nicely. With these fighters and sort of heavy fighters and slightly larger mini shuttles there as well and you can see those are kind of alien style inspired shapes to them they are getting exactly the same treatment again and you can see quite a few of them have quite nice panel lines on them ready to take the oil wash on there and these were a much quicker process to sort of whiz through really and to to use the oil washes it's just a quick dab in some of the areas on them made the oil wash quickly go into the recesses. These small fighters are some of my favourites and actually I think if you do them in bright colours they kind of look like a school of tropical fish slightly and just a pleasure to paint up as well because they're, they're small and neat, really quick to do so I picked some from this range from Brigade models and I haven't done an awful lot here, you know I've done a couple of wings of them just to see how I go on with the different ones. Uh, these I think with the dual front areas of the ship look really great and the smaller ones behind although I like them they don't have quite the same cool factor to me as these um, these sort of almost dual hulled so what, do you, what do you call them maybe a catamaran of the uh, small fighters and you can see there the washes are just going in actually put them on either side of that sort of wing that's in the middle of them and uh, it sharpens them up quite nicely In hindsight, I think these could have done with uh, a colour on the wing as well, sort of a little stripe maybe on the wing, or possibly a third coloured stripe towards the front to give it two bands of the dark against the orange there. It would have just given it a slightly more waspish style look. But overall, again, I'm happy with them. You know, I'm just getting these done really. And then once done, I can look back and say, okay, probably could have done with a change here and there. But just again, the oil going on around the main areas on the hull, even those are small, you can just see how they, it just picks out the detail. And on those ones to the top of these, which I've just done with the, with the dual catamaran style hull at the front, they look great now. They've had that sort of darkening around the edge of the, uh, around the cockpit. And that's incredible detail as well. And these are the Brigade model ships. And you can just see having those cockpits just on show a tiny bit, really. Uh, sharpens these up. You couldn't have done that, I mean Tony at Brigade Models couldn't have done that without these being done in uh, a 3D modelling uh, and then printed and then finally cast in metal from the uh, sort of master uh, 3D print that he does so you know you you don't you just don't see this level of detail on anything that doesn't have um, uh, a sort of 3D print quality to it. Although having said that the uh, historical models from GHQ, the six mil range they do, men, most of those are still uh, handcrafted out of tiny little bits of plastic card and they do have incredible detail for the size.
the very pleasing last stage coming up here where I'm just cleaning up the oil pin wash where it's flooded over outside of the details a bit and just sharpens it up to tidy it. I mean, it's kind of unnecessary, but you can see there by using that Q-tip or cotton bud, I'm just taking away the oil. So they've had about two or three minutes before uh, this activity. You can't leave it overnight, actually, because it gets a lot harder to remove the oil. You probably could still do it, but I think if you leave it until it's dry looking, at least, uh, which is about three to four minutes, and that's when the terps has evaporated off the surface of the model. Most of it has, and you're just left with the oils. So then you uh, dampen the end of the Q-tip inside your terps, and then go straight on like this. Now, you could use your cheap cosmetic Q-tips or cotton buds. Uh, the problem I found with those is that they tend to fall apart a bit, so you end up with little tiny bits of cotton threads uh, stuck here and there on a model and I uh, recently experienced that. I don't know why I went for it but uh, even when I was doing it I could see and this was on some 28mm fantasy models I could see the thread starting to get caught on the model as I was cleaning off the oil so not wise really best to try and get hold of these if you can they're the Tamiya brand I've got here and uh, they're available on, on most hobby stores and I got these ones on Amazon very cheap and as you can see they give you a nice hard end rather than uh, a soft q-tip so dipping it in the terps get rid of some of the moisture and then just you can see again there on the top of that panel it just pulls away all of the oil that had over flooded and that's all that's being removed it's not removing the paint because if you can remember from a couple of steps before i'd spray varnished these with a gloss varnish so that's protecting most of the paint So it feels a little counterintuitive and maybe a bit complex uh, additional work to remove the mess that you've made on here but I, I just find it quite therapeutic just you know moving around cleaning off where the oil paints splashed over and it also does a nice job of refining those panel lines that you've got so it sort of sharpens it up a bit more in some cases you could just leave it because it does just look like weathering but obviously at this stage with the ship still being gloss varnished before I've dull coated it, it kind of looks a bit scrappy as well. So because it kind of looks unusual, you have a kind of a matte bit of oil in those corners with everything else bright and glossy. You can't really see the final effect until you've uh, put the dull coat on. But again, it's a case of persevering, and you know it's quite satisfying to sort of spot a bit that's that's oversplashed. Now some of it you could leave as weathering. You know, just behind that section on that ship, I've just pulled off a patch of oil that uh, had overspilled when I was putting it into the panel lines there but you know you could leave it as a little bit of weathering it's uh, it's not going to be the end of the world once it's sprayed up it will just look again like a patch of different colouring or damage or darkening of the hull from some kind of uh, debris uh, maybe they've been through an atmosphere at some time or they've used a fuel scoop in a uh, in a uh, gas giant's uh, clouds and debris and bits and pieces have uh, dirted up the hull so there's no reason to have to clean every tiny bit to make these uh, spotless but it does uh, it does sharpen up those panel lines quite nicely This larger brigade model ship here I noticed when I was cleaning off the oil that there were quite a few panel lines along the back there and along the side on the major flat surface that I'd missed so I actually came back with some extra oil afterwards and uh, yeah cleaned up quite nicely. You can see the gloss again really shining on these and that uh, that dull coat's going to help when that's finished on there. So after that oil clean up, I left them for about a day and then I sprayed them with Tester's Dull Coat. It's a can of matte varnish spray. Spray it all over and it dulls them all down. So that gloss stage then is hidden away and you just get a nice even tone and the oils in their recessed panel lines look more natural looking. 
I'm not a massive fan of this kind of cigarette lighter style chunky ship and wasn't really happy with my paint job but I just saw it through and it's okay. These ones I've had now for a couple of years but I finished them as part of this project just by getting a few more decals on and, and also doing the pin wash. I'm quite happy how they look as a fleet but again they don't really grab me but I enjoyed them anyway. These smaller ones are some of my favourites of the whole range from Brigade models. Really just like the way they can look like a bit of a school of fish or something as they fly around. The chunky retro look and um, just a general style of them. Just really like those. The cravac, I did tiger striping down the side. That was hand painted on because you can't really mask them because of the amount of bits, but they're okay. These ones, I definitely went too high a contrast on the panel lines with those deep recessed panel lines that they have should have done a lighter shade but overall again learned something from it and they look good from the tabletop height you know close up like this uh, warts and all they seem a bit strong and contrasty for my eye the smaller ones though brilliant really love that style of ship again that kind of slightly retro look i mean there's really not much to them but just they just work for me these four evan ships for traveler are just really nice models so really enjoyed painting those and uh, airbrushing them as well and i think of the of the set they're the most enjoyable to have done even though they're slightly more expensive and they're obviously plastics as well but uh, fantastic models really enjoyed doing those because i was doing them as part of such a large volume of ships at the same time i think i actually could have done them even better by taking more time over the masking to place it more symmetrically or some definite stripes that are a bit cleaner the small ships, I haven't decided whether to put them on these type of bases yet. I'm just resting on there for photos and took a couple of different lighting shots. And this is the Fort Evan Shapeways printed ship's boat, which I think I put too much time on doing too many different colours on it. But the overall effect, again, from tabletop height as well, it's a small model. And this fleet from Brigade Models is the one I would grow if I was building out a larger sort of fleet for a full thrust game or similar because I really like the styling and the flat look, plus just the grills and everything take the airbrush detailing really nicely. So probably my favorite set of the lot, really. So for storage, I've got them all in one of these Beasley drawers, which I can sort of file away. And it's because they've got magnets on the bottom, they all just clip in there, so they're not gonna rattle around or anything as I pick them out. So then I can just take them off and put them on the Corsair engineering bases very easily. So this was a bit of an epic undertaking. I think I painted too much at once, but <laughs> I'm happy with the results. I got them done and they're done now, ready for use in games. Plus I can now start developing bits of the fleet, which I want to extend. And also I want to do more of those unique uh, traveler style ships, like one-offs and lavish a bit more detail on which I'll probably make into videos too. So thanks for listening in and please comment below with any questions or any tips or ideas as well. Thank you and goodbye.